And people also use the term artificial intelligence. Now, yeah. I want to be clear, this isn't the evil robot or artificial intelligence. Right. This is a good robot. And what, what's been happening at the demonstration facility is we've been showing that we can carve off about 20% of energy use while still meeting all those public health criteria and maintaining all those safety factors and using the machine learning to give us information that's, that actually lands at the hands of the operations staff. Short on local water supplies and long on regulatory requirements. Do a deep dive with us by listening to the Full Circle Podcast to learn how Las Virginas Municipal Water District and the Triumphal Water and Sanitation District are meeting 21st century water supply challenges for a portion of the Los Angeles and Ventura County regions. Hello to all of our listeners and our viewers. Welcome to season two of the Full Circle Podcast. My name is Ricky Clark, and I am your host once again. And we are back today talking about the design of an advanced purification facility, right? So in our first season, we got into a range of topics. We got into the why, the who, the what, the where, the region. We got into the regulatory side of things. We talked numbers and the costs that go into putting together this type of project. We talked to a host of experts, um, both internal, external. We talked to some consultants. Um, we really got into the nitty gritty. And so we're back for our second season um, and we're getting into an additional range of topics, including the building and design of an advanced purification process. So I'm super excited. I have two amazing guests here with me. And I'm going to attempt to speak to their extensive experience in indirect and direct potable reuse. Um, but I know I'm going to have to have them speak to it as well. Because who we have here today, they have a combined 50-something years of experience um, in advanced purification and building these kinds of um, projects. And we're going to get into some really interesting topics to speak to what all goes into the process, what you have to think about design-wise, production, regulatory, a little bit regulatory-wise, um, and everything that goes into the design build. So let's get into it. I want to first introduce Andy Stottlison. Um, he is our guest number one today, and Andy is vice president at Corolla Engineers and is, and is an internationally recognized expert in water reuse, treatment, and regulations. With over 29 years of environmental consulting experience, he provides guidance and expertise on potable reuse and reclaimed water purification. He has been involved in projects spanning the United States, as well as Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and Australia. And our second guest, Adam Zakais. <laughs> he is Brown and Caldwell's Western Water Reuse Practice Lead. He is based in Los Angeles and has well over 25 years of experience in alternative water uses and developing resilient water portfolios. His background includes process engineering, pilot plant research, membrane water treatment plant design, advanced treatment facility design, and advanced oxidation technologies application. Oof, got through that without studying. I feel tired. <laughs> <laughs> tired, yes, lots but of lots of background, lots of experience between the two of you. And again, you guys have been doing this almost as long as I've been alive. So I don't want to even try to explain everything that you do. Can you both speak a little bit to your background and your experience with advanced purification? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a start, uh, and and I, I do want to acknowledge, you know, we're here today as part of the Walsh Progressive Design Build team, uh, so we're working together on the on the very exciting uh, full scale project. Uh, so, uh, just a, a little, maybe just a, a little more background. One of my favorite uh, uh, quotes is, you know, it's 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 not the it's not the age, it's the mileage. And, and there's been a lot of mileage, uh, you know, developing pure water in the state of California, going back to the 60s and getting here today. I started in the late 90s on pure water projects. Uh, and you see that same rigorous effort being progressed through this pure water project, through the demonstration, with which Adam and I were both privileged to work together on mm -hmm. and then moving on to this really next exciting phase. Oh, we're so excited to have you guys on. Yeah. We've been leaning on you guys for years, so we're happy to have you lead up our full scale. Yeah. We're so excited. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm really excited about reuse. I started my career as a young engineer uh, in wastewater, then I moved to water, and really started to emphasize on advanced treatment membrane type of processes, which 
kind of made me fall in love with reuse. I also got the bug when I was young as you're visiting the Water Factory 21 oh, nice. at Orange County Water District, which was the predecessor for GWRS. Um, it's really exciting projects and really beneficial to communities in California. So uh, I'm happy to be part of this team. 100%. And I'm glad you mentioned the bug because I believe that came up in our first season. I forgot which guest, but they did mention that they got exposed to the engineering side of water as a child, and it just sticks with you. It's a lot of people, once you get into water, you never want to get out. Yeah, that's that's something that we've been talking about within some of my uh, teams at Corolla is, is you know, the, the best engineers are the ones that just passionately love what they're doing. And, and, you, and you do see that here. You do see that with the JPA. You do see that with the operations, with the engineering. Uh, you know, this is both really, really important, and that's the primary thing, really important, but it's also really a, a great engineering challenge, and it's very exciting to be a part of. It is, indeed. It's been exciting for me to learn about since I started here. We've been embarking on this process since before I started at the JPA. Um, and so learning about the process, everything that goes into it, and being able to collaborate with the professionals and the experts like you guys um, and kind of get more into the nitty-gritty, it's been really fun. So that's what we're going to do today. We want to kind of dive into the process itself, right? So when we're talking about pure water, we talk about – um, the environmental protection side of things, getting out of Malibu Creek, which we spoke to extensively in season one. We talk about the additional benefit of creating a new local supply of water where we don't currently have one. We talk about the use for recycled water. But I want to talk about the star of the project, right? The advanced purification process. This is the three-step process that takes recycled water, which is highly tertiary treated, clear, odorless water that we use for irrigation, sends it through the three-step process, ultrafiltration or membrane filtration, depending on the infrastructure used, reverse osmosis as step two, and finally UV AOP to get that pure, nothing but H2O water that is so crisp and so tasty and we all love it. That is going to create our uh, new local supply of water to the tune of 30%. Um, why don't we get into that process? Can you kind of help our viewers and our listeners kind of visualize what's going on with each step of the advanced purification process? Yeah, sure. Well, I think, first of all, it's really important that you, you mentioned the Tapia wastewater treatment plant because that's really doing a lot of heavy lifting yeah. as pre-treatment for our advanced water purification facility. The wastewater treatment process is pretty advanced, and it removes a lot of contaminants before it even gets to AWPF. So that's yeah. very important to keep in mind. Yeah. Then we get to AWPF, there's different processes such as low pressure membrane filtration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet advanced oxidation processes. Maybe Andy, you could talk about the low pressure system and sure. we could work through this together. Sure, yeah, <laughs> bounce, bounce it around, right? So, so we've got, uh, and the state requires these things, and, and so we go through these multiple barrier process. And we want to have a number of points where we're removing chemicals and pathogens through the system. And when we talk about pathogens, you know, we're talking about bacteria, protozoa, virus. So the first step is the, uh, we call it the ultrafiltration process. Uh, point, uh, point zero 0.01 micron, right. very, very small. That means super, super small, much smaller than the human hair mm -hmm. size. Yeah, and thank you for contextualizing Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, if I had hair, I'd show you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's removing all this, all, any remaining solids that are coming out of the system. It's removing a good number of the pathogens, uh, and it's providing this really important pre-treatment before it goes on to the next stage where we start <laughs> removing salt. Right, mm -hmm. and the RO process does that. It's uh, really a great barrier for treatment, and uh, you know it filters down, filters water down on a molecular level. Mm. So if you were to think about um, the pore sizes of a RO membrane, uh, when you the compounds that even the smallest compounds that encounter that membrane are still you know uh, probably a hundred times larger than that pore. Yeah, 10, and 10 when you say pore, times. we're talking about like the holes. The, in the opening that right? the water mm -hmm. passes through on the on the reverse osmosis membrane, and when you start talking about pathogens like bacteria, they're massively larger than those pore sizes. I think one time I saw a graphic of it's like trying to push a semi truck through a a, a tennis racket or something. A straw. Yeah, 
So we it's, love it's, those contextualizations. Right. Please so keep them coming. <laughs> really filters the water down on a molecular level and removes pretty much everything, including the salts, to uh, make that water really tasty. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, think about and there's a lot of energy that goes into removing the salts. So we want to. I want to come back to energy efficiency yeah, concepts. But but if we work through this, you know, multiple barriers for removing these chemicals and microorganisms or pathogens, as we say, uh, and we also are monitoring very closely each of these processes. So e so each system has multiple, not one, multiple analyzers looking at different things that are talking to each other mm -hmm. and telling us, yeah, check each process is going through. So think mm -hmm. about red light, green light as that water moves through the process. We get to the third key process and it's ultraviolet light. Uh, and it's combined with a chemical. We call that an oxidant in this case. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is what we like to use. Chlorine, bleach, it's the things you get you know, off the supermarket shelf. Right, household uh, bleach. So it's very mm -hmm. house, yeah, people are very familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Operators know how to use it. We add a little bit of that in ahead of the ultraviolet or UV reactor. Uh, and then that, that system is a, another important workhorse. It, 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 any microorganisms that have potentially gotten through, and I want to use that word potentially really clearly, mm. right? It's highly unlikely. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they get through that last process with the UV, the ultraviolet, it, it will uh, wipe those guys out. Right. Uh, and, and then that also does several other things. There's, there's also some chemicals, extremely low, what we call molecular weight chemicals. They're super, super, super small. They're smaller than salt. And they are, uh, and and they're coming through at nanogram per liter levels, which I'll, let's come back to that as well. Uh, that that last system then creates what we call hydroxyl radicals. And not getting too much into the weeds here, mm -hmm. but what these radicals are is they're the, they're these just these little molecules that are looking to just like rip electrons off of chemicals and destroy them. Uh, so they they're going crazy in that UV reactor, uh, ripping apart any uh, organic chemicals that could possibly be in there. So when that we come to the end of that treatment train, we now have a water quality and, and there's no hyperbole here. It's the highest quality potable water that we have on the planet. Oh, Andy, please repeat that. Yeah, well, <laughs> so you go, repeat that for you go, you go back, you can go back. I mean, you know, these purified recycled water projects uh, have been uh, running in the state of California since the 60s. Uh, and and the, the evolution of technology to today that we see at the demonstration facility, mm -hmm. you know, that's the latest, greatest uh, version. Um, and, and what we know through the National Academy of Sciences uh, out, of, out of DC, mm -hmm. uh, and what we knew through study after study after study, what we know from medical professionals, uh, is that this level of treatment, the processes that are at the demo, uh, they are removing chemicals and microorganisms to a level that far go beyond the, the criteria for public health. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes to the level that we have, uh, we have to actually add minerals back into the water so that it is, we'll quote, stabilized, right. so that it can go into the environment and, and not pull minerals out of pipes on the way there right. or other things. Because super pure water is considered aggressive, it's right? Aggressive. It is. Yeah. And, and we don't like aggressive. We don't. We like want aggressive. docile. We want chill. We want chill water. <laughs> we want that's better. Chill, water. chill That's better. Yeah, we want chill water. <laughs> exactly. I think it's important to also notice, you know, as we're, as we're going through these processes, it's important to realize we, we're putting in place multiple barriers to stop pathogens and contaminants. So there's lots of belts and suspenders to protect public health here. And with the uh, really rigorous monitoring, uh, we're ensuring that these processes are always working to spec to protect public health. You know, when I talk to, you know, I've talked to my daughter or my kids about what I do, um, you know, and other people, they think, oh, you know, they like, well, how can you really treat water to be this pure? And, mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to remind them that, you know, this is a very technology driven uh, industry that we work in and things are always uh, ex are always advancing and becoming better right. in terms of performance and uh, the purification processes it's no different than you know my first cell phone just called people exactly right and, and that technology has do. rapidly advanced and it's no yeah. different from what we do as engineers in this water purification yeah yeah can you speak a little bit to the automation that goes with the process, right? Because you talk about like the bells and the whistles that go into the redundancy and, and the checks, you know, to make sure that everything is working properly. Can you speak to the automation and how our operators kind of get to work with this process and how they can monitor what happens at each step? 
Yeah, I can start that off. So as a design engineer, is a, like we're, we're starting to have these discussions right now with, with your facility. It's very important for us to have an appropriate level of control so the systems are always monitored. We have lots of chemical analyzers mm -hmm. and different ways to monitor the health of the process so that it's always running optimally. And that also involves putting fail safe. So if uh, one of the processes was starting to fail in any way, we can take the system offline so there's no um, chance of public health being impaired. And, um, you know, Andy, you can maybe talk a little bit about uh, log reduction value credits and how that works and to in also ensure public health. That's right. That's right. So so the, you, these systems are designed, they're not being run right on the edge. So mm -hmm. so we have the water quality criteria that the state sets and the, the D Division of Drinking Water within the state of California, they are the most stringent regulations uh, anywhere in the United States and, and frankly globally. Uh, for this type of project mm -hmm. so so we know those minimum standards the system is designed with higher levels of safety factor beyond that and we're not trying to go crazy here we're trying to cost effectively implement but we right. go with safety factors mm -hmm. and then our monitoring systems then are set so that they are providing warning alarms well in advance before they get to any critical mm -hmm. level uh, and so each treatment process has what we, there's a term log removals and mm -hmm. and you can envision you know logs in the creek and that's not what we're talking about uh, we're talking about you know one log is 90 percent removal two log is 99 percent well for these systems we're looking at 12 or 10 log removal of different uh, different uh, uh, microorganisms so high degrees of safety factors now I do want to come back to the efficiency stuff because on the controls yeah. uh, the uh, we are trying to meet and attain we're trying to attain all those higher levels of safety and water quality but we're also trying to use less energy we're trying to do it everywhere right we, you've got your solar fields where right yeah. where we're trying to generate power locally absolutely uh, the less water that we import less water that we have to pump less energy we use for that uh, so let's not go overboard here and, and, and make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. So this is an area where the JPA has really excelled, uh, won a number of innovation awards uh, nationally uh, 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 with, with different organizations. <laughs> Pointing right behind uh, <laughs> Organizations within the state, organizations across the country. Uh, and it's been focused on these concepts of machine learning. And uh, people also use the term artificial intelligence. Now, yeah. I want to be clear, this isn't it, the evil robot or artificial intelligence. Right. This is a good robot. And what, what's been happening at the demonstration facility is we've been showing that we can carve off about 20% of energy use while still meeting all those public health criteria and maintaining all those safety factors and using the machine learning to give us information that's, that actually lands at the hands of the operations staff. So it is not making any decisions. Those right. decisions are being made by certified operators right. from, the, from the JPA. Uh, but it is showing that we can start carving off chemical use, you know, use less chemicals, haul less chemicals through town, less truck traffic, uh, and use less energy. Yeah. And so there's some really exciting things that are on the front edge that are also uh, we're looking to to include in the full scale system, right? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because in our first season we had um, our now retired director of facilities and operations, uh, John Zhao, and he spoke to uh, our use of artificial intelligence in the demo and also kind of contextualize it, you know, because obviously AI has been a hot button topic and, you know, chat GPT and open AI and all those things. Um, and he was really giving us some good context as to how we use AI in our everyday life already, right? So there's not always this need to have this fear of this beast that is AI, but look at the ways which we can use it positively. We're not using it to replace the human factor, but to enhance the experience of our operators and make their jobs more efficient. And being able to demo that and test it and put it to good use in our demonstration facility is going to help us leaps and bounds in the future, especially with this process. Yep. To yeah, totally right. agree. Yeah. 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 We <laughs> want it to support operators. We don't want it to run the system. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. We never want to replace that. <laughs> well, I think if I could just a little bit further, Please. I mean, the, the, the people that are in our water business, uh, the vast majority, it's all focused on public health and the public trust. Uh, and and so for something as critical as water, we we not only want but we need to have the the human interface, yeah. the human control, the human judgment that is then supported by the by the machine learning. 100%. Uh, so so yeah, let's let's keep that let's keep those decisions in the hands of those certified operators and do what we can to to help be more efficient through the whole system. 100%.
And Andy, you kind of spoke to this um, in the realm of water quality, right? This project is a huge project to improve water quality across the board. We're getting some of the highest quality water. Um, when you're talking about water quality, you get into a bunch of different terms and a lot of terminology. And something that's been um, in the headlines lately, at least in California, when you talk about those stringent water quality standards, um, are like MCLs, right? Um, limits of what can be in the water, contaminant limits. Can you speak a little bit to how those are set and the science and the process that goes into setting MCLs? And why do we have limits? Why can't we just not have any contaminants in the water at all? You kind of touched on it already. Sure. But I really want to Maybe I'll start it. it and then I'll pass it over to Adam, right? So, you know, the state of California has, as I mentioned before, the most stringent water quality regulations, right. not just for advanced purified water or purified recycled water, as you like to say, but also for conventional drinking water. Mm hmm uh, and so, the, you know, so that starts with MCLs, maximum contaminant level. Uh, you know, those numbers are have a health-based component, but they mm -hmm. also have an economic-based component. Right, exactly. So, so it's not just uh, get to this level and you're safe. It's get to this level and here's the technology you can use to get there, and it's not incredibly expensive. Right. The state goes beyond that. Uh, California has notification levels, which are not hard regulations, but you can bet that this facility is going to be monitored and controlled to meet those numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, it has action levels. It has uh, CECs. I'm, I'm sorry about all the acronyms. <laughs> CECs are uh, uh, chemicals of emerging concern. What right. is that? It's anything you're worried about. Right, or uh, should be worried about yeah, in the future. <laughs> yeah, so, so, uh, so, so these things are all part of the demonstration facility. You can go through all the demonstration results. You can see each of these categories and how they're removed through purification. Yeah. You can see the standards that we set both within the state and internally. There's internal standards for water quality. But maybe, Adam, you could talk a little bit more about the removal of these things and, and what it means. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to point, first of all, too, that, you know, some of these chemicals, like the notification level chemicals, sometimes that they get promoted up to have an MCL. So the, the state is constantly evaluating these chemicals and adding new regulations. So we've got to really provide a really robust system mm -hmm. to pretty much remove every, everything we can. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the, the treatment processes, again, we talked about a lot of these get removed through the uh, reverse osmosis and the UV advanced oxidation process. Um, I did want to note that when we're designing the facility and it's all constructed, uh, we go through a very rigorous process to prove that we're removing all these chemicals and we're meeting those drinking water standards. Before we even put one drop of water in the Los Virgis Reservoir, we're going through extensive testing. When we start to fire up the UVAOP process, we actually put a, a huge number of these chemicals into the inlet of that process and confirm that the process is indeed removing all these chemicals. Now that water is wasted to the, you know, to the sewer. It doesn't go sure. into a drinking water source, but we make sure that the process is running as it's supposed to get certified by off from DDW before we're, uh, we get the permit and are able to put that water into the drinking water system. If, if I could add one, one bit is, and, and this is important uh, uh, understanding, is that this is purified recycled water. Mm -hmm. That does not mean it is 100% only H2O. It's the highest quality water that we have in our municipal supplies. I mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, are, we are looking to hit the regulations, have safety factors upon those, and, and still with all that, there will be times where there is a nanogram per liter, and I'll get to that, nanogram per liter of a chemical that is still in the finished water. Now I'll tell you that there is, that those numbers, the nanogram is like a drop of water in I believe 10,000 Olympic swimming pools. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that still, the more important item though, is that the orders of magnitude of safety that is in that. So any right. of those chemicals that are at that in infinitesimally small level have been demonstrated again and again and again to be well below any level that has a public health risk. And so going back to the energy then, this is a responsible project to make a purified water that meets all regulatory standards with a safety factor, but it is not 100% only H2O. It is It has uh, some aspects of other things in it at very low levels. Right, and I always think about it in terms of, you know, water, obviously we need it to live. But water is also an environmental factor. It's something that is out in the environment and get ex and can and does get exposed to any and everything. We have the technology to clean it. We have the innovation to get it beyond our health standards. 
but ultimately things exist everywhere, right? We have the safety measures there to make sure that it's not impacting our health in a negative way and ultimately making sure that we continue to protect our customers' health and, and well-being in a way that's also cost-effective, right? That's, that's right. kind of what grounds it. We mm -hmm. have the technology is all out there, but ultimately we have to make sure that a project like this is funded fully, right? And remains funded and something that we can continue to keep running and costs always come into that. We don't want it to have too much of an impact on our ratepayers to the point where we price them out of, you know, living in our region. So I'm glad you guys both spoke to that. There are many factors that come into play when we're talking about this kind of purification. Yeah. And, yeah. and safety's first. Of course. Safe, safety's first, but as design engineers, when we're going through the, the design of your facility, we're always looking for ways to, to save cost. Uh, but again, the safety is always at the top. Uh, we yeah. take that very seriously. Yeah, 100%. So you spoke a little bit to the nanograms, right? But I know another buzzword that comes out a lot is like parts per billion, parts per trillion. Can you contextualize that a little bit in terms of these MCLs and, and our water quality standards? Uh, yeah, it's not like he. I think he did that a little bit. We're talking about you know a drop of water in ten thousand um, uh, lipid sized swimming pools. It depends on the the concentration limit because mm -hmm. they're all a bit different. So sometimes some are higher, or some are lower. But in general, we're talking about an incredibly low levels of, of residual chemicals that could be in this in the water stream. I don't know if you have anything to sure, add. Sure. Well, that. just the kind of the orders of magnitude. So yeah. So the the state would like to see our drinking water have salt levels of 500 milligrams per liter or less. It's called a secondary maximum yeah. contaminant level. That's a milligram per liter. Uh, and that's also a, a part per million. And then there's the part per billion or a microgram per liter, right? So that's that's a that's <laughs> A really thousand times down. lower, a thousand, right? <laughs> and then there's a part per trillion or a nanogram per liter, right? And that's you know a thousand times lower. So we are we are uh, or in in each order of magnitude is a safety factor that's being put on. And these regulations on MCLs, some of them are in the milligram per liter. Mm -hmm. Some of them, a lot of them are in the milligram per liter. Some of them are in the microgram per liter. And there's a few that get to the notification level that are in the nanogram per liter. And it's those that we are uh, paying acute attention to in the engineering processes uh, because we want to get well below those numbers. And mm -hmm. so if you go out to the demonstration facility, go check out that UV advanced <laughs> oxidation, its goal is to hammer down below those notification levels into those very low nanogram per liters or, or well below any detectable level uh, for the vast majority of the chemicals that, that, that anyone can sample for. Got it. Detectable right. is key here. Right? Yeah, and we've yeah. got a couple, you know, a uh, couple chemicals coming out that, that we use to monitor the health, the UVOP process goals we have to meet, like the one for dogs and an NDMA that are very, very low levels, and that's basically a surrogate for everything else, mm -hmm. if you if you will. Um, so yeah, the demonstration facility I think has proved that the process works very well in meeting those limits and getting these contaminants down to incredibly low levels. Yeah, worthy investment too, especially for outreach, right? Being able to have this facility and show how we're proving all of these things before we even go full scale, I think that's been a huge part of our outreach, obviously with the podcast, but also in tours and being able to just allow people to see the process, ask their questions, learn about stuff like this. It's been invaluable. Right, you look at the demonstration and it's had really five aspects of success. Uh, we talked about the research, right? right. But mm -hmm. And that's great. It's super exciting uh, and it's important. But the other four are actually more critical. Uh, you know, you have uh, engineering efficiencies. So through the different uh, membrane systems that have been run out there, we're able to determine which are the best suppliers, uh, how can we run those as, mo as most energy efficient as possible. Right. Uh, you know, through the operations, that system is run, controlled, monitored like a full-scale system. So your uh, your advanced water treatment operator uh, program is all being developed through that demonstration. Uh, you've got regulatory aspects, mm -hmm. uh, heaps uh, of, uh, of information from that demonstration are being used to get the regulatory permits for that facility. And then you have the public aspect. So the, the first uh, four that I mentioned are all about gaining engineering knowledge, operational knowledge, and your own internal confidence right. in that quality. And then that last one is the public engagement, which includes 
local elected officials, statewide people. You have tours. I know people come from Australia the, uh, last month. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but hi then you, to our Australian Yes, friends. yes, <laughs> yes. And I did say, by the way, hi, Mom. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so, you know, you have uh, – but then you have your local people, the yeah. people that are going to drink this water. And, and so all that confidence and information over the last four years, that all uh, – can I use a, me- a membrane term? Permeates. <laughs> Mm. Permeates to this terms. to this comfort <laughs> level of the safety and the quality and the ability to see, hear, and taste that water. Yeah, yeah. the demonstration projects already provide us invaluable information about how we're going to design the full scale system. Uh, we're we're talking about the data coming from that facility uh, we, every week. Yeah, as part of the design team, right, and having some really great in depth discussions about the path that we'll take with the full scale facility. One hundred percent, and we're always happy to share this information with our colleagues, right? That's another big part of outreach with this facility. We have staff from agencies all throughout California come, and you know that's what we do in water, right? We don't believe in reinventing the wheel. The wheel, whatever research that we have or experiences that, that we have, we love to share them, and hopefully agencies um, that are looking to undergo their own demonstration facilities specifically before they go full scale they're able to listen to Adam and Andy speak to this um, and share it with their board who you know they don't know if they want to make the investment and they can see why it's very much worthy of, of an investment in time and money right yeah sometimes you know people say well why do you need to do a demonstration facility because in California we've got a really good track record with these three main processes they've been shown to work over and over again but really having that reuse platform just makes us design these these facilities a little bit better with each iteration. Yeah. And um, the research is really exciting about things that are, you know, we can do in, in terms of the a- the machine learning and AI and how we can improve these systems to make them more cost effective. Yeah. I think it's a really great idea to, to undertake these demo projects when you can. Yeah, 100%. And Adam, you provided a nice leeway going from, you know, how do we take what we're learning with a demonstration facility and put that into now constructing and commissioning a full-scale facility. Can you kind of talk about what goes into that? Right. Well, anytime we start to design one of these processes, it's all about water quality. It's about the goals at the end. What What are the water treatment objectives in terms of the, the, the potable water uh, quality requirements that we have to meet? Mm-hmm. And then what what's the starting point in terms of the water we get? So. Uh, you know, all the, even though these advanced treatment facilities can be inherently the same in terms of treatment processes, they're all pretty different, actually, and they all have their unique challenges. Yeah. Um, so, for example, for this facility, we're looking at just look at the demo data to determine how to optimize the um, recovery and the, oper- the re- operation of the reverse osmosis process. So we're looking at p- disinfection byproduct formation potential and how to make sure that that's removed from the final treatment stream. and uh, uh, other types of useful in- information that we'll need to set the design criteria for the full-scale facility. Yeah, one one e- example, and, and Adam mentioned tap. Well, actually, Ricky, you mentioned tapia, and then Adam added to that was uh, that the first treatment process here uh, it doesn't. It, it's kind of it's it kind of gets pushed to the side. Oh, reverse mm-hmm. osmosis and UV advanced oxidation. They're the they're the big ones, <laughs> but but the one that actually carries the load most of the time is that first process. Yeah. And so because of that, it's designed very conservatively, lots of membranes, which means lots of cost. Uh, what we're finding uh, through the demonstration is that the quality coming from Tapia is so good, mm-hmm. right? It is so good that we're able to cut that first process down. Again, keeping our safety factors, mm-hmm. keeping our redundancy. We've never got to keep compromising producing, never that. compromise, mm-hmm. and there's no compromising on safety. But we are shaving millions of dollars off the full scale system because of the research that's been done, the demonstration mm. on that one process. Yeah. So, can you repeat that one more time? Which part? That very last part about <laughs> saving, <laughs> saving money for the other water professionals yes. and board members and yes. elected uh, and decision yes. makers out yeah. there. Yeah. Well, so so. Uh, we as in, we were part of the demonstration facility. Mm-hmm. We know what it costs. Yeah. Uh, you can probably go on the record and find what that was. It was not cheap, but it was not also very expensive. Yeah. I will say that we've recovered multiple times over the investment in the demonstration. Mm. All right. So so if you include, you lump all the costs together for building the demo, operating the demo, it's in the low million dollars range. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the savings that is accrued on the full scale system, it it probably triples that value in savings uh, because we're able to 
we're able to then, as engineers who are always super conservative, right? Like yeah. you should have seen us make Lego towers, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, we are so conservative, but we see that data, years of it, and it's reliable. It allows us to, to cut some of the engineering conservatism off mm. and save that money and, again, still meet all those quality standards. Right, and the timeline of the demo has been really great because it's been running, what, four years now? Yeah. So that you know, the more historical data we have, the more confidence we have in the data, and and that can drive the full scale design. And so that you don't have to be maybe necessarily as conservative in certain areas in terms of your treatment processes. So yeah. again, I agree with you. It was well worth the investment. Yeah. Yeah. It's something like more than a head start. Obviously, a cost saving measure, especially, mm -hmm. and ultimately just making it easier to go full scale and implement for you guys and our staff internally. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Your internal, it's it can be overlooked. But the internal confidence in the process, again, that radiates out. Yeah. Uh, you can feel it, and, and that's super important. Yeah, absolutely. So this full-scale facility, um, is this something that's going to be able to be ran year-round? Um, what can we do to make sure it's operational all year? Can you kind of speak to that? Obviously, the source water is the recycled water, mm -hmm. and we only have an excess of that in the winter months. Um, so what are we doing to kind of make sure that we're maximizing the op the uh, facility as far as um, it's operating? Uh, that's a great question. So you're right. Currently, there will be intermittent operation right now when mm -hmm. there's, uh, because in the summer months, there's not really recycled water that can be pushed to the advanced water purification facility. Uh, so it's up to us as engineers to design the system so that we can shut that system down for, for lengths of time, mm -hmm. uh, but be able to start up. And more importantly, it's important to uh, design in the adequate level of redundancy, uh, process equipment, and you know, things like pumps and analyzers and everything that mm -hmm. goes with that, so that when we do have the water available, we can make sure that it's running and it's running full time. So our goal here is that in the winter months, when the water is, this plant is gonna be running full time and not shutting down. And um, as time goes on, I know that the district's looking at uh, further sources of water that can augment or go into tapia yep. to produce water in those off season. So in the future, I uh, hope they're going to get to a point where we can run this plant year round. Yeah. Uh, but for now, we're setting up to be a very robust and, re and plant with a lot of redundancy so that uh, we can run it as much as possible whenever there's water. Yeah. And yeah. so what you can visualize in the full scale uh, facility is there's going to be uh, a number of parallel systems. And as that available flow kicks in, Right? As soon as that's available, we're turning on these parallel systems, mm -hmm. ramping up production, getting that water into the lake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the use of the equipment itself? So I'll start. Uh, that was a key part of the demonstration facility. Okay. Is, uh, so I didn't mention that. But, but the system was the demonstration facility was designed to, and for a period of time ran in an intermittent mode where we would shut down components of it, restart components of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course we would love to run it consistently, full tilt, no valves opening and closing, uh, et cetera. That's the best way to run things. But the demonstration facility has allowed us to show how we can take components of it offline, sometimes for months. Mm. So during the summer months when the recycled water is cranking full, uh, then we will be taking some of these trains offline and setting them aside. We put a, a special liquid into them so that they are uh, preserved, nothing's damaged on the system. And then, and then as the recycled water starts to taper off, the purple pipe water starts to taper off, we can then clear those out, start them up, get them ready. It's not immediate mm -hmm. in that case, mm -hmm. uh, and, and get them into service. So there will be some that are ready to go and running at a low level, and then there'll be others that we have set aside and saying we're not going to, you know, it's, uh, it's the box for Christmas, you know, do not open until you have purple pipe water. Sure, but they uh, won't be wasted, right? No, like they will not. We'll be able to restart them back They will back not up. be yeah. wasted. Yeah. They will not be wasted. There will be a, a period of time with the operators, a uh, period of day as we get those ready right and then you know when we're at lower flow events and we've got some standby units or processes uh, trains we call them mm -hmm. uh, we will rotate through them so everything's being used and staying you know active uh, you don't want to you know you don't it's not like it's like having four cars at home and you only run one all the time right you want to run all four of them sure. so we're, we're gonna we we cycle through that you have four cars 
I have three, actually. Close. <laughs> Impressive. But we, we want to preserve that equipment, make sure it's being used as yeah. equipment that sits idle yeah. is not a good thing. Well, redundancy seems to be a term of importance here with these discussions, and that definitely plays into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but can you kind of just really highlight how the system is being designed to maximize production? In right. the now and into the future. Right. So I'll, t- I'll talk about that uh, to start at least. Uh, so that's that goes back into the redundancy discussion. So what <laughs> we do is with the uh, with the MF, and RO, and, and UV o- AOP trains, we'll, we'll have as multiple trains, and some of those will be standby. So as we get more water, we just activate more trains, which pr- which enables more capacity, production capacity of the, of the plant. Yeah, so the system the system's targeting being able to purify the average flows coming out of Tapia. Mm-hmm. You know, so we, we we look forward to the day when it runs consistently at a full six million gallons a day and yeah. is really really a, the, maximizing the value of the project. Yeah. Uh, but but at first we're going to have these a lot of these uh, systems, some systems offline. Uh, we have that redundancy in there. Now you did mention the redundancy concept. I want to come back to it. Is, is that the reliability of this system, you know, this is all also tied to the Malibu Creek and making sure that we're getting out of the creek as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when these systems are running, when we have a process train, we have an analyzer, a turbidity meter that's, mm-hmm. you know, flashing offline or something like that, or um, we have a membrane that's saying its performance is reducing, uh, then we are able to bring on uh, these redundant trains mm-hmm. before we have a problem and before we need to stop production. So maintaining production is an extremely high priority for the project. Yeah, 100%. And it sounds like utilizing these trains is a way to obviously maximize operation operationality. Is that a word? Uh, you, it is now. It is now. <laughs> We're making it a word, yeah. <laughs> so uh, maximizing the production, I'll say mm-hmm. that, um, while also being the most efficient with the space that we have, right, and the land use. We have this dedicated plot of land um, that we had to go through an extensive CEQA process for, um, and, you know, it's nestled in the hills. It's a highly protected area. We want to make sure we're doing the most with as little of a footprint as possible. And it sounds like these trains is the right way or utilizing these trains is the right way to do that. Yeah, that's right. We're, we're sizing these trains to be as uh, space efficient as possible so that we can uh, put the entire production capacity in the smallest building possible. Right. That makes sense. You yeah. know, we, we want some space to, you know, it doesn't, ha- it doesn't, we don't want it to be cramped, yeah. but you know, we, we know that buildings are expensive. So yeah. uh, we're really going to work hard on optimizing that layout and how much space we need. Yeah. And leaving, and leaving space on that property, you know, for nature. That's oh, yeah. right. A hundred percent. I yep. mean, as the JPA, we always look to do everything that we do in an environmentally sensitive manner. That's like our guiding, you know, star, right? So that is definitely played into this. Um, I have one more question. Do you guys trust the safety of this water? I absolutely do. I've been doing <laughs> this for a decade. I, I go right. to all these facilities and I drink the water. I just drank the water from the demo this morning and I've Me that's too. probably like the fifth time I've done that. Yeah. It's tasty. I love it. Um, love it. as an engineer, you know, I've I, I this is this is my profession is something I do every day. I trust these processes. Um, I've seen the water quality data. I know it works. I know it's incredibly safe water. Yeah. I tell people I'm from the Midwest, right? So I tell my family about this and this water is very pure to Andy's point before uh, when you think about people on the Mississippi, you know, what they're drinking. They're mm-hmm. taking water out of the river, purifying it by conventional treatment. It's right. not nearly as pure as this. This water is really, really pure. Right. Highest highest, uh, highest amount of, of regulations, oversight, sampling, treatment barriers, uh, all that, and, and the rigor. And, and it's important to recognize, mm. well, so I, I – Short answer is absolutely <laughs> uh, believe in the safety of this water, have been part of the safety of this water, yeah. uh, and very confident in the safety of this water. You also have to then remember that the rigor is critical, that operations training is critical, mm-hmm. maintaining these barriers is critical. And so we put these together, and we have, since the 60s, success on this in California. But it is a rigorous process. And, and, and so we maintain that high level of awareness mm-hmm. as we will run the project, you know, 20, 30, 40 years into the future. Yeah. 
you know, I really ask that in jest because obviously mm-hmm. you guys are so involved in these processes and you know them inside and out, but it really is important to hear from the professionals. It's not just about the ability to do it or the knowledge that you guys have, but you both each have buy-in um, on this product and these processes all over California, all over the West, the country, and other parts of the world. And so it's important for our listeners and our viewers to be able to hear it kind of from the source, in, in a sense. Um, and obviously, if any uh, one of our viewers have been to a tour here, you know that I trust the water because I drink the water all the time, probably more than <laughs> I should. I taste it, I should say, so we don't get in trouble. Um, but it really speaks, and you'll hear any of our staff say the same thing, and the consultants that we work with, um, Yep. This is some of the highest quality water you can get. So, yeah. so Ricky, I've got a new term I'm working on. So I live up in Ventura, just up the coast here, for those watching that aren't from this area, part of Southern California, yeah. uh, about 30 minutes north of here. And they're developing their own pure water program. Mm-hmm. And my new term is YIMBY. Yes, in my backyard. <laughs> so, so I love you know, that, the, Andy. The, uh, so, that so absolutely believe embrace the need for alternative water supply in the state of California. Yeah. So just to maybe step back, right? We are going through unprecedented uh, drought and flood cycles yeah. on, the, on the central and south coast of California in particular. Uh, and, and we, community after community, have these periods where we are, our water supplies are dropping drastically mm-hmm. low. We need an alternative supply, purified recycled water, is the most cost-effective new water supply we can bring into these communities and through things like the demonstration and 40 years mm. of application yeah. the safety is there Decades. so so count me in the yimby camp i would also Absolutely. like admission into the yimby camp <laughs> i love that term actually we're gonna start using that here <laughs> um and yeah i mean you know andy you really kind of brought it home very nicely i think that innovation has always been considered sort of a guiding light for the advancement of mankind, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout time, we rely on technology so heavily as human beings and it's not the time to shy away from it when it comes to protecting our water supply and making sure that we continue to have enough water into the future. And you both are the experts to let people know that this is what it looks like, the Pure Water Project advanced purification is what it looks like continuing to rely on that innovation to make sure we can still exist in this region and beyond absolutely we're yeah. seeing it everywhere too right Andy? yeah that's right it's a, it's a great tool yeah for water resources and it's a privilege Security. to be a part of it it is oh yeah and we're so excited to have you guys here and excited to have you on this season right we wanted we wanted to do last season but we couldn't quite do that yet but now that you're officially on board um, we're happy to be able to lean on you guys, and we appreciate that you always make yourselves available um, for our shenanigans, like <laughs> being on our podcast. We know you have a lot of work going right now, so we appreciate that you've made time to sit and kind of wax poetic about advanced purification. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so thank you. That wraps up our episode, All Things Advanced Purification, and we will see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.